All right. Hi. Welcome. Hello. Uh, this is a balancing act, crafting effective design systems in limited resource environments. Oh, please tell me this is going to work. Come on. Maybe not. Okay. Well, we're doing the. Maybe now. There we go. Okay. Yeah. All right. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, first we'll do an intro. You know, what is a design system and why you should have one? Oh, thank you very much. Um, what do I mean by efficient and limited resource? Um, in part one, we're going to assess and communicate value, talk about the value of the work. Part two, we're going to talk about gathering resources. What are we building? What do you need to make it happen? And in part three, we're going to talk about bringing it all together. Some tips and tricks for building and communicating. So what are we going to learn? Hopefully we'll feel empowered to build what you need, you know? It doesn't have to be a huge daunting task to build a design system. Uh, I want to reframe a design system as a living document, not just a big complete piece of work. You might learn how to make a lovely beef Wellington. I'm not going to teach you, but you might learn that in the next 40 minutes, I don't know. And we're going to learn some tips and tricks for implementation. So what is a design system? Are there designers here, most of designers? Couple, couple? Developers? Project folks? Other? Cool. All right, so I'll go through this kind of quickly. It sounds like most people are probably familiar with what a design system is, but it's a set of pieces that could be used to design and build websites. It's usually made up of styles like colors and typefaces and components like buttons and cards, and often atomic design is used to organize them, which is just a concept of making bigger things out of smaller things. Um, just like in the natural world. So you can see here this button is an atom. It's used to make a molecule, which is this email input box. And then the organism would be this uh, newsletter sign up component. A template that might be on would be like at the end of every blog page, and a single page that might be on would be like your home page. So a little bit of a glossary because the term design system is, you know, kind of <coughs> interchangeable. So a brand guide. You know, these are typically seen in print, marketing, you know, they usually refer to colors, type logos. They aren't usually designating how to use those pieces in a digital context. I'd be using, you know, to make stuff more like that. I'd kill for those sesame socks. Um, and pattern library is another thing that design systems are sometimes called. Um, but, you know, design system might come with guidance for how to use and combine the components. It's usually used primarily by designers. The way I've, like, absorbed this in my head is that, you know, a design system would be the single source of truth and then developers could create pattern libraries in different platforms using those rules in the design system. So you can see here, this is GitHub's, and they've got the header, the subhead, um, and that's all in the pattern library, and you know, a designer would have rules for the header and let you know what the size and, and style should be there. So why have one? Helps build websites that are consistent, accessible, and easy to use. It's a single source of truth for how things should look and feel. They're fast to use super quick to build a website, uh, a page with a design system once it's implemented. And it brings you closer to development by using similar layout, spacing, language. Um, it just keeps getting closer to uh, the latest Figma update with variables. It just We're just moving closer and closer to, to development. So what do I mean by effective? It's enough to speed up your work. It's a living document mindset. So we're always working on this. And it might mean you know you're working backwards from live. That is what is effective. Limited resource, it could mean you have a small team, maybe a small budget, maybe you have limited time constraints, maybe there's a lack of support in your organization. Effective doesn't mean perfect. And speaking of imperfect, who am I? My name is Molly. I work at Last Call Media, I've been there over five years. I've been doing design for over 10. That's my cat, Frankie. If you give me a platform, you're gonna have a picture of Frankie on it, so she's very cute. So how do you know it's time to start this design system effort, right? Maybe you're making the same changes to many components. Maybe you're noticing mistakes getting through despite your best efforts. It's you know, super frustrating to see that stuff get through. Maybe you're referencing a PDF brand guide. Maybe you've got hex codes written on sticky notes all over your desk. You ready to start your adventure? Sounds like you might be. So part one. Assessing and communicating value. So we're going to talk about planning your request, having an LOE level of effort for the work, how to make the request, and how to appeal to stakeholders. 
So stakeholders, I'm gonna use this a lot, and I just wanna talk about what I mean. That's the Beef Wellington presentation, sorry. Uh, might be a PM on your project. Might be an account strategist. Might be your team lead. Might be a client contact. But in the end, you're all part of the same team. You're all working together. Don't think of them as, as an adversary, but think about them, of them as someone that's on your team, part of this work, and vital to doing it well. So you know a design system's gonna improve your speed, your consistency, accessibility of the components, your prototyping, and your communication with development. But, you know, sometimes those don't resonate with everybody on the team and, and the stakeholders. So a good way to think about it is what are we actually asking for, right? Have a plan. So we want to plan our request. Be clear about what you need or what you can live with. You know, you're probably not going to have a full person dedicated to working on this full, complete design system. But, you know, think about what levels of effort you could compromise on. Think about different amount of time and how helpful each level of completion might be. Talk to some folks that are going to be affected. You know, find out what would help them. And try to focus on the highest impact work. You know, we're trying to understand what we're asking for. Setting up styles or variables will be hugely helpful. You know, other basic components like a banner, header, footer, buttons, card components, you know, even better. And so now that we have a plan, you know, we've kind of pared down what we want to ask for. How do you make your request? So consider your audience. You know, developers might be happy to learn about the inspect capabilities uh, in different software. PMs might be reassured knowing that accuracy will increase and QA will be faster. Everyone should be excited about a higher level of accessibility. But what about stakeholders who don't stand to benefit on a day-to-day -day basis? You know, this isn't gonna make their life easier in the minute. You want to appeal to stakeholder priorities. And so think about their strategic goals, right? Business goals. That might mean we're working faster, we're saving time and money. For government directives, we can know that these components are accessible because we've checked them. And always think about organizational strategies. So like, maybe if you're a business, you're really wanting to get more webinar signups this year. And you can say, okay, well, if we have all these components, it'll be super fast to build these landing pages. And you know, I'm gonna reference this a couple times, but the delivering a digital first public experience order talks specifically about forms. And you can say, okay, I've spent a lot of time working on these input boxes. We can now turn all our PDF forms into digital forms super quickly. So let's just assume we've got our support. Everybody's on board. Let's gather our resources. So we're gonna cover what we need to start, who can help us with this work, what the work will actually be, and how we're gonna go about it with care. So what do you need to start? Do you need that PDF brand guide to find styles? Do you need web versions of typefaces? You know, this probably exists in a PDF document somewhere. There's probably a download link. Are you familiar with the inspect tools? Uh, that's something we use a lot uh, in Chrome or whatever browser. Do you need a link to a pattern lab or a storybook page if there are already live components that you need to build from to, uh, to build some screens? Do you need to make a Kanban board or do you want to find a project tracking tool? Do you need help planning the work? You know, help making some JIRA tickets, making a backlog, thinking about how to go about it. So how are we going to gather those things? Let's talk about the who. The what and the how. So who? Talk to people, which of course, right? You know, interview other folks in your team and uh, try to understand what parts might be beneficial to them. Do a little internal research. Try to learn what will be helpful. That continues to raise the value of the work throughout the organization. And try to think of folks that can help in an advisory or production capacity. This doesn't mean just other designers that are gonna help you build components, but you know, Developers, client-side collaborative vendors, accessibility experts are super, super helpful both in the planning and when you're doing QA on these components, making sure that they're they're good to go. And then, you know, content designers or site authors, those people are super familiar with inputting content and the actual pain points of working with the site. So it's gonna assemble, it's time to assemble your team, probably not a cat, although they are good at walking on keyboards. You might want to talk to a project manager. They might be able to help you set up that JIRA project, the backlog, the tickets, if that's how you want to manage the work. Um, you might want to talk to some designers and developers on the client side, make sure everybody's aligned. And you know, whomever's maintaining the site might want to know about what's going on. There might be other vendors who are open to collaborating. So your team is assembled. What is the actual scope of the work? You know, we already talked about 
paring it down to what's, what's doable, what's actually going to be efficient. So when resources are limited, what do we start with? We start small, of course, right? So even setting up basic styles or variables is going to set you up for success. You're going to have a much higher level of consistency and speed day to day in your work. And think about what will be effective for your team. Um, you know, it's different for everybody and every, every group. Something is better than nothing, always. So what are we building? You know, what are your most used components? Try and think about when you've had to make an edit and you've had to change things across multiple components or, you know, there was a, a client request and you had to hunt down several things. Um, you know, here I've got a card, I've got a call to action, I've got some, some buttons. And, you know, on the topic of what's useful to you and, and sort of paring things down, this is the card from the previous slide. And that actually came from our design, our UI kit that we're building. And it started with the Franken card. I call this our Franken card. So it's got every field that we found in cards across sites. You can turn it on and off. Hideous when everything is on, but when everything is off, it makes sense and it you know can be used for an event teaser, a blog post. You know, it has a lot of uses across things. So think about what'll be effective. This is kind of unusual. People would probably have a blog card and an avatar card, you know, but this worked for us. And this is a little uh, screenshot from a Supernova blog. These are the 10 most common design system components. It doesn't say most used. And you, you know, you've kind of got to think about what works for you again. Because avatar, you know, if you don't have a profile on your website, that's not going to be a very useful component for you. Um, but it's still interesting to see button 25%. Like, that's, that's pretty crazy. So, you know, continuing with what we're building, auditing your sites. So. Here you can see we looked at a couple of peer sites and we started to kind of block off identifiable components and looked at what was common in the industry and sort of named those headlines, subhead, data, and attribution. Then we took all of those, we laid them all out in post-its, and this is a design team working within a design team. So this might not be the best you know, way of working, you might want to do this in a spreadsheet, but we then put all the different fields that were in each found ones that could be combined, like that card component. There were a couple that were super similar, and we made that sort of Franken mega card out of that. Um, and so we were able to pare down, you know, what showed up often, what would be the easiest to build, how could we pare down to fewer components that did more things. You could find out if development's using a UI kit or a pattern library, you know, this is Tailwind UI, they might start with USWDS, everyone's talking about that here, of course. Um, but the UI kit I keep referencing that we're building, we based it on Tailwind because a, a bunch of our developers were using that. And so we've just set up this uh, email newsletter sign up uh, in, our, in our design style. You know, we just kind of tweaked the spacing, made it a little more useful for us. And make sure you're making it fun. This is one of my favorite components on a, a state design system page. And uh, you can see that they've gathered inspiration from outside their industry. So. Again, with the theme of, you know, make what works for you. It's me and this is the last one before dinner, so, <laughs> yeah, they're getting inspiration from a familiar place, uh, but definitely outside a government industry, so cool to see that. Um, consider your use case, right? I keep talking about your industry and what types of sites are you building? So you can see in this from the same audit, um, the yellow, I think, was components that we see typically that we would already have in a design system. And then I think these green ones were ones that were sort of specific to this industry. So you can see this documents and resources <coughs> component was sort of proprietary to this industry, but it occurred enough across our peer sites of our clients that it would make sense for us to build this and have you know, the PDF icon and the link and the attributions and stuff all set up so we weren't building that every time we were working on a site. Where can you prioritize work? Right? Are they frequently accessed via mobile device? You know, a lot of government sites are accessed by mobile primarily, and often that is the person's only way of accessing the internet. And so maybe you focus on making really, really great mobile layouts, and you know, try to work with your developer to build, the, you know, the bigger breakpoints. Um, you know, I'm going to keep referencing this forms thing from the the delivering a digital first public experience, but you know, a form field might not be the basic basic building block of a lot of design systems, but for this case, it might be super helpful. You know, you can build a few input boxes and know that you can digitize a bunch of forms really easily. So now that we know what we're building, how do we do it? So how do you fit this in? You know, we are in limited resource environments. We don't have a huge, I hate to say the F word, Facebook budget. Um, 
but we can do it. And how do we do it well? So we can squeeze it in when there are a few resources, you could estimate it into your work. So if you're working on a screen or a component that includes a reusable component, and if you have basic style set up, you can add these uh, components as you're prototyping, as you're building. Um, you know, once you finish it, add it into the full design system. You can put it on your calendar. You know, if you're on a longer term project or you're in-house or something, you know, try to set aside a couple hours a week. Rome wasn't built in a day. You can chip away at it um, little by little. You can make it happen. And so how do you do it well, right? We want to work with care. We want to think of others. So try to create situations where it's easy for others to use or help with your work. Communicate that you're working on this. Make sure you're in a file that people can access, you know, in the organization or team inside Figma or Sketch or it's on a drive somewhere that other folks can access um, and be super open about it. You know, be collaborative. You know, try to move forward in the best way that everyone involved can understand. You know, teams might have implemented different best practices or started files in different places, um, but you know, try and use what's there. Be respectful, um, and you know, find those different files. There might be, you know, for example, we were building a design system, and, and uh, another vendor in us had versions, and they had a beautiful organization system, and we had a couple more components, and so we kind of combined those into the, the best case scenario, and everybody uh, won there, so that was really great. So now what? We've got the who, the how, and the what ready to come together. Let's bring it all together and build the thing. So what's next? We've got our people on board. We have what we need. We know how to do it well. So this part, we're going to cover some tips and tricks for collaboration, building and communication, planning for the future, um, checking the quality of your work, and continuing on with your design system. Okay, fine, we'll talk about some specific Figma stuff. So branching, we tried it. You know, great collaborative tool that added some complexity that our small team didn't really need, but it might work for you if you're working more asynchronously or with a larger remote team. Um, Variables, I've used styles kind of interchangeably with variables throughout so far, and you know, it's conceptually, it's styles. Um, and you know, I try not to stress about staying up to date with every single thing in technology. Figma was the third design software I've learned in my career, and you know, that's all well and good, but the soft skills of adapting and understanding the building blocks is a lot more important. I was there when they announced it, and I still haven't changed any of our stuff over to variables. Uh, but I've tried one, it's, it's cool, it's definitely bringing us closer and closer to development, so I do appreciate that. Um, all right, so finding what you need, right? Do some digging, check and see what other work has been started. If you begin after components already exist, you know, we've found that using inspect is a really great way to make our, you know, our mockups in Figma match as closely as possible to the live site. So we found the color, we found the type style, we found the margin and the padding all right here just by inspecting this little component. Wait, what are you using to inspect that? Because like that's, some, what are you guys using to do that? Is that? Uh, the, just the Chrome inspect tool, the built-in. It shows you those things? The tools. Yeah. I mean, I use that all the time, but I've never seen something that shows the color, the font, the margin, the padding. There's a... Um, it's like an icon in the, the top of the bar, or I guess it be, I do the bottom. But it allows you, when you hover over a component, it pops up with this, so it's not part of that lower Snap. menu. Okay, cool. Yeah, I can find it after and, and show you for it's sure. Square, right? Yeah, yeah, it's like a, yeah, and so you can hover over each thing and find each type style, it's super, super useful. Um, and then you can know if you need to ask for those fonts, what the font is. So, you know, make sure to make it yours. So give styles or variables specific names. So this is the last call media black. It's almost black. It's not black. It's 2D, 2D, 2D. Calling it black might have caused confusion because they would have just put in straight black and that doesn't have that softness that we intended. You know, if you need additional fields or different ones that are typical, build that. Like our Franken card, that works for us. It might confuse other people, but with communication, you know, that was the way we found that most helpful. <coughs> um, I noticed a lot of things people are using color roles now, which again is that I think design is just creeping closer and closer to development, so there's, you know, attention, success, open, closed. That's from the GitHub design system. And a lot of folks are using the roles to describe colors. Organizing your pages uh, is super, super helpful. This is another thing that uh, that other vendor I've been working with did really, really well and we pulled over and have, uh, have used. So 
You want to label and organize your page as well. It helps anyone navigate the file. You know, even if the terms are slightly different, components, UI elements, they'll still pretty much be able to find what they need or are looking for. And it's always helpful to designate an area for work in progress. That could be, you know, we've got a page here with the little caution thing, but that could also be a section that you've blocked off in the, you know, in the components page. You could use some sort of annotation system to tag, like, this is in progress, this is done, this is with development. So moving on to that, project files can have a component too. So if you're building a feature or a project and you know, you've got your own file for this ticket, you know, if you have a component section or a component page, it's gonna make it so much easier to move the approved components into the design system rather than searching through that file for those little purple outlines and, and making sure you've got everything and linked it up to the design system. Don't leave design debt. It is a thing, it is a thing. So have a QA process. Have a checklist for finished pieces. Uh, one thing that's worked really well is that we have swapped components as we've been working on this UI kit with other team members. They do a little pull request and uh, we check it for you know responsiveness, breakpoints, all those things. Um, and then we pass it on to our accessibility expert. So be an ally. Be thorough about accessibility on that checklist beyond color contrast. You know, you want to make sure there aren't difficult interactive elements. You know, note if there needs to be a required alt text field for an image. And you want to make sure that you have a plan for things to be keyboard navigable. So on to that annotation. Um, this is an annotation kit that we built to help us, and the last call colors just happen to work really well for this. Um, but you can find or make one. There's a ton on the Figma community. This makes asynchronous communication super easy across teams. You could also use comments to track. As long as you're communicating clearly, you know, like what's completed, what's in progress, what might be helpful to dive into next, uh, whatever works well for your team. But you can see here we've got, you know, left and right dev notes, we've got states, so we can say this is the primary version, the state is hover, um, this is the medium breakpoint, we've got spacing. Um, by no means is this finished, it's another work in progress, but uh, it's been very helpful for us. So development communication. <clears throat> this is a zoomed in version, and this is a lot of the same, like I mentioned, tailwind styles, tailwind breakpoints. Um, you know, if time is limited, at least communicate the essentials to development. You know, we are talking about limited resource. You might not have time for an hour sit down meeting where you go through all of your screens. <clears throat> but you can also know your team. You know, some developers can think super creatively on the fly and see your intent and, and work with it, but some might need a little more specificity in the documentation. Um, and you can see here I've used our, our notes, you know, cards are sorted in alphabetical order, the main container has a max width of 920, so doing a lot of that asynchronously and um, that's worked really well for, for us. So, you know, communicate clearly. It helps if there's a design system that is built in multiple pattern libraries to, you know, link to those sources. So you can see here, I put it up here big, but these are buttons in a design system that exist in a in two different libraries. They exist in React and they exist in a pattern lab. And so we link to each. So when a developer follows that link to your main component, they can say, oh, I'm working on the React project and, and grab that button. So you want to have a team agreement too, right? As you're continuing this, we're talking about it being a living document and you are kind of squeezing it in. It's a little, little bit of a limited situation. So you want to determine how to continue the work. You could wrap it into tasks like we talked about, you could schedule it, or you could find another way that works for your team. You wanna decide how to communicate changes. You know, are you gonna use comments? Are you gonna use branching? Are you gonna use Jira tickets? Is there a Slack channel for this effort? You could start a cadence meeting or a community of practice. I kept telling me cadence wasn't spelled right or it's not a real word, I'm not sure. So we're ready for launch. So hitting publish. I, this might be my Adobe Illustrator days, but I'm inclined to hit publish early and often, that command S instinct. Um, but you know, publish whenever you feel like, talk to your team about how comfortable you are doing it regularly. You know, you don't want people to be surprised by that review components and then a bunch of stuff on their page changes. So let folks know when you publish, you know, especially if you've added large pieces, if you're not doing branching, in which case they'll get an approval screen. And you wanna to remember to add those new components. When we were talking about adding a component uh, page in each screen you're working on in a feature, you know, make sure you remember to add those. Relink that file, you know, remove them from, from that individual file and update the library. Do as I say, not as I do. Six months is too long, but uh, 
This effort's been put down for the moment. Now it's time to spread the word. Let everyone know that your design system is live and that you're still working on it. Let them know where to find it, how they can help, why you're doing it. You know, be an ambassador for this work and ask for feedback. So now we know. What is a design system? Why is it important? We know how to talk about the value and communicate the value of this work. You know how to gather what you need and make a plan. And we talked about some tips and tricks for implementing the design system. You're doing a great job. It's tough work. It seems It can seem silly from the outside, but it really does speed up stuff. And so, you know, keep fighting the good fight. I know it's the day after Halloween, but I still like this little skeleton guy. So. Thank you. So that's a QR code for a feedback link. I would love any feedback. It's six questions, mostly multiple choice. Um, it'd be super helpful to know how I could improve. Um, if you want to add me on LinkedIn, that's my last call email. And everywhere else, I'm molly.pizza. You know, come talk to me about these things. That's Call of Duty and Fortnite, yeah. Um, you know, travel, cats, photography. Feel free to come talk to me about anything. Thank you. Could use branching, um, but that screen I showed with the autosave, you can see version history in Figma pretty easily and you can go back to it. Um, so like I said, our team is pretty small and it's been pretty easy to see and, and manage that. Uh, but you might want to use branching if you are you know, have 20 people working on the document. That would probably be too much to track in that little sidebar with autosave. Have you guys been doing anything with um, tokens? Not yet. It's definitely something that we talk about again and again. We really want to try the storybook um, plug-in as well. And like I said, I think that the variables uh, addition to Figma is going to really make that easier. Um, I think we just need to take some time and, and dive in with the developer. But um, yeah, it's definitely something we're excited about. A lot of the, because we're in an agency setting, and I probably should have led with this, um, we don't often revisit the design systems enough that it makes building tokens worth it, so most of our developers seem to be like, just do variables and it's fine. Um, but yeah, in the case that we were doing something bigger, we'd probably want to explore it. And also we want to just check out Storybook because it seems really cool, that connection. You uh, said to have a plan for things to be keyboard navigable. Can you talk more about what that means or what that type of plan might look like? I can steal from our accessibility expert and what she tells me. Yes. <laughs> Certainly. Um, so in those annotations we have, uh, you can kind of specify at a certain break point. You know, you don't want to, on a form, you don't want to jump box to box. You want it to jump from the box to read the label. And so writing those things down, noting those to developers, a lot of developers nowadays like know that and are pretty good with it, but um, yeah, she typically writes it down and um, you know, making sure things like a card only has, like the whole card is clickable uh, because if it's title, image, title, title, like it's, it's gonna read the same thing over and over. So, you know, specifying things like that, that it's not duplicating what the screen reader is saying and things like that. But uh, yeah, we're super lucky to have a wonderful accessibility expert who uh, really helps out with that QA, like I mentioned, a super important person to bring in. Um, do you have a base template design system that you start with and like customize, or do you start from scratch based on like your post-it notes for each of the elements that you need? Well, I think it would depend if like, if a brand exists, right? If you're building something, you're coming up with the colors for the first time. Um, that UI kit we're working on is sort of part of that effort to not have to do, redo it every time. Um, but you know, using Inspect, adding all of that in, you know, you're working from something that exists, so it's kind of just putting it, putting it in there, um, which you know isn't automatic 
you have to create the styles and um, but yeah if you're designing a site for the first time and you're like capital D designing it and you're coming up with like this is my primary color this is my secondary color you know you'd want to be adding it but the goal for our snowball UI kit would be that we just start and we have primary secondary danger alert and then we just change the hex codes so all of that is already ready to go um, and like I said it's based on Tailwind because we know it's pretty good at having all of those things and you know it's a little bit of overkill like Tailwind has <laughs> every color has like a full graded value of like 90 to 10 and not every site needs that so you know we've worked with development to remove what we don't need but um yeah starting with something like that is super helpful because it, it has all those features that you need out of the colors, out of the buttons, all sort of built in and thought about already. Would you recommend design systems are always publicly shared? I mean, I wouldn't think like Coca-Cola is going to share theirs, right? But I think in, in government, I don't see the danger really, you know, like what are we, what are we doing that would be a secret? Um, you can spoof a site that makes it look like it's a great place to put your uh, social, social security. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, USWDS is, is open. Um, I guess that's a decision you would make with your organization, with your client, with your team, whomever would be in charge of that. Um, I always think, you know, Last Call has done a bunch of open source projects in development. I always think it's good to work collaboratively and openly. You know, I would love to have this Snowball UI kit available. I would have loved to have a QR code to it, but as you see, we've had to put it down six months ago. Um, but yeah, I think it's always good to contribute back. You usually get more out of it than the risk is, unless it's a government, you know, fraud. <laughs> So like maybe I'm in the wrong session, but um, imagine you have like basically like a team of one, which means like I'm the developer and I'm also the person who's asked to design it and to do the QA and like, yeah, yeah. right. So um, we're talking low resources here. So right. I am probably, and I'm not a designer, right? I did stuff, you know, 15 or 18 years ago when, when there wasn't really good mechanisms. So, where's a good place to like, if I need to like, steal somebody else's design system? Do you have recommendations for like, if I, if I, cause like, I don't need it to be a particular color, I don't need it to be a particular like font or, cause like, this is for like an internet, right? So I could be, it could be anything. So, do you have recommendations for like, hey, this person has something in place that's, cause I know like, there's like, um, like, Microsoft has their libraries, Google has their libraries, there's yeah. also something like they call like this is what I think is like a good starting point to say, okay, if you want to steal from these people, this is like a good place to start. I mean, I don't work at all adjacent or with USWDS, but I would say that something like that where you can be pretty sure that it's accessible already. Oh, cool. It's probably open source on GitHub, you know, there it's probably easy to access. There's probably a decent amount of support too, and and you know communication. I think there's Slack channels and, and teams for it. They have a um, file. Yeah, they do. They have an official Figma file. Yeah, it's okay, I was trying Imagine to find it. I Figma. <laughs> okay. Imagine uh, this is the first time heard, heard the word Figma. Right, GitHub. Okay, Figma is a new tool. It's the new Sketch. It's the new XD. It's you know, okay. we're, we're just building sites. A lot of those screenshots I showed were from it, and it has a lot of, yeah, super cool developer tools, and, um, but yeah, there's a lot of stuff that's open source. I'm trying to think, I think IBM's Carbon, I think is what they call their design system, that might be open source. You know, I'm a designer, I know what's available in Figma, and what the community files have, it might be different in GitHub with the actual code, they might keep that a little more close to the vest, but, um, yeah, yeah, I think, you know, going with something like USWDS, which, you know is going to be accessible, you know the components have been thought out, it's checking all those boxes. It might not be beautiful or cool, not that USWDS isn't, but you might have to change some visual things to fit your brand or whatever, but um, it's better to start with what you know is like accessible and, right. yeah. I should have checked if that's on GitHub. I mean, I'm sure it is, it must be. I'll find out tomorrow in the training. <laughs> Have you had experience or looked into using zero height? 
We did actually use zero height for a while, yeah. Um, and that is one pain point that we definitely experienced when we got rid of zero height, doing that documentation. That's where that annotation kit came out of um, because we had nowhere to put, like below X breakpoint, it does this. Um, we actually found it was mostly like the developers were going right to Figma and there was only one client that was looking at it and it was okay if they didn't anymore. So we decided it wasn't worth um, main, like maintaining two sources of truth and just doing it inside Figma. That said, it's still not perfect. The annotation kit still isn't perfect. Zero Height definitely did some stuff that was really great, like when you did the fonts and it kind of filled in everything, that was awesome. So it would be nice if there was something that was like a plug-in for Figma that did the same thing. But again, I just said don't hang too hard on technology and you know, I'm kind of all butt in on Figma now, but it is pretty crazy to go from, in my pretty short career, I've gone from Photoshop slices to variables. It's kind of wild. No Fortnite questions, really? A <laughs> single one? Okay. Do you play Save the World? No, should I? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, noted. Another question. Okay, I'm going to stop recording now.